What's going on guys? This is Jared Hall with Modern Pain Care. And what I wanted to do was put together a quick presentation that actually looks at some of the literature on what central sensitivity is. There's been a lot of discussions going on lately and seems to be a lot of confusion. And you know, I myself was pretty confused about this as well, which uh, caused me to dive into the literature on it and, and figure out what does the literature actually say that central sensitivity is? So hopefully with this presentation, we can get a little bit of clarity and uh, refine our thinking. So central sensitization is actually an increased responsiveness of nociceptive neurons in the central nervous system to their normal or sub-threshold afferent inputs. So essentially it's just, it's an upregulation of the central aspects of the nociceptive system. So if you see the little diagram I've created there, the little picture, you have a little bit of nociception coming up the peripheral nervous system, and as soon as it hits the central nervous system, that is increased, and you see a, a lot bigger degree of nociception facilitated up to the brain. So why do we have central sensitization? And in a nutshell, it's our nervous system telling us to pay attention. And if a noxious stimulus overwhelms the nociceptive defense system causing some sort of tissue injury, the imperative is no longer avoidance of a noxious stimulus, but it's rather to enable healing. So if we make something extra sensitive, it's more likely to heal because we're more likely to avoid overusing whatever that area of the body is to prevent uh, further injury or to allow for a little bit of a mobilization for healing because if something hurts really bad you're not going to walk on it you're not going to press it you're not going to use it or bend it or twist it or whatever it may be so nociception is to alert the brain of potentially noxious stimuli central sensitization is one mechanism to make things hurt more so you pay more attention to it um, central sensitization happens almost invariably in any sort of tissue damage and some literature actually says it has the tendency to be worse and longer lasting when the peripheral origin is in the joint or a muscle rather than up some other form of connective tissue. So all that being said, central sensitization is normal. It is a completely normal aspect of injury and how the nervous system responds to the nociceptive system being a little bit overwhelmed. So Central sensitization is a normal form of nosis or a normal component of nociceptive pain. So if you have an injury, like a muscle strain or a broken bone or a bruise or a ligament, you definitely have some peripheral sensitization locally at the site of the tissue injury, but you also at that point that the nociceptive system has been overwhelmed and an injury has been sustained, central sensitization will be a component of that to upregulate the amount of nociception that's going up to the brain so you pay more attention to it. It's also a normal component of neuropathic pain. So things like radiculopathy, carpal tunnel syndrome, phantom limb pain, and, and CRPS uh, type 2, where there's a lesion to the peripheral nervous system. And we, we know that the nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, has its own um, inherent nociceptive system as well, which is the nervi nervorum. Um, so what you'll get is when that message is, when, when, the, when that nociception is facilitated up to the brain, again, when it hits the central nervous system, it's going to be upregulated, so we pay more attention to it. And then finally, central sensitization can be a normal part of nociplastic pain as well. And nociplastic pain is um, a little bit controversial, but I think that if you understand what the creators of the terminology um, were trying to state, it makes pretty good sense. So nociplastic pain states are those states that aren't explained by nociceptive or neuropathic pain. Things like irritable bowel syndrome and chronic low back pain and migraines and fibromyalgia and CRPS type 1. So in these conditions, there's no um, notable site of nerve injury and there's no notable site of significant tissue damage that should be causing nociception. But if we know that the central nervous system can be facilitated through central sensitization, central sensitization could play a component in certain nociplastic pain states. So how does central sensitization begin? 
Uh, well, sensory inflow is activated by tissue injury that induces an increase in the excitability of nociceptive neurons, right? This amplifies the effects of peripheral inputs that were formerly subthreshold. So you got to remember, we're getting nociception all the time, every day, right now, in this very chair, I'm getting nociception in my, in my rear end, in my back, all over my body from the amount of pressure that's actually being placed, placed on it. And that's what causes me to shift and move around and lets my brain know that, hey, you probably shouldn't stay in that position for too long. Otherwise, you might end up with some, some tissue injury or a little bit of damage. Um, so people that are unable to move or are non-responsive to nociception typically develop pressure ulcers and that, and that sort of thing. So nociception is there to say, hey, pay attention to me. You stimulated mechanical nociceptors for long enough and you've actually sustained this position long enough that maybe the pH has decreased in that tissue. And now we're activating chemically mediated nociceptors just to say, hey, move a little bit. I'm going to make you a little bit, I'm going to help the brain make you a little bit more sore. I'm going to help to shift your position so you constantly stay in motion because the body likes to stay in motion. So um, these changes can enable, you know, innocuous mechanical inputs to now engage nociceptive pathways. So that's what's called tactile allodynia. So when something that should not hurt at all now all of a sudden is perceived as painful because there's a there's a large upregulation of nociception in the central nervous system. It can cause the spread of sensitivity outside the area of injury to non-injured tissues, and that's called secondary hyperalgesia. So the, the, the field spreads a little bit because the central nociceptive system can um, kind of crosstalk to uh, nearby areas. And then there can be an increase in the response to repeated uh, inputs and that's what's called temporal summation to where if you apply you know 25 newtons of force to an area and the first time that hurt a little bit and the next time that hurt a little bit more and the next time that hurt more and the next time that hurt more that's what's called temporal summation where you get a reduced capacity to tolerate repeated exposure to the same exact stimulus and that's through a component of uh, that central sensitization so temporal summation is a component of central sensitization to upregulate that little bit of nociception that's coming in with that repeated stimulus. So essentially in a nutshell, the nervous system changes functionally and structurally to encourage you to pay attention to what's going on. So it starts talking through a megaphone, so you'll listen. So a major feature of the nervous system is its plasticity and modif modifiability. Nerves that fire together wire together. And uh, this is how we can get into maladaptive pain states. So plasticity most of the time is adaptive. However, there are certain cases that it could be maladaptive and um, prolonged exposure to a nociceptive stimulus that leads to prolonged um, presence of central sensitization could cause some functional and structural changes to the way that the nervous system works, which could be somewhat maladaptive. So to quote Clifford Wolf, one prominent example of maladaptive neuroplasticity is seen in those forms of neuronal plasticity in the nociceptive circuits in the central nervous system that constitute central sensitization and which represent a major underlying contributor to many persistent clinical pain states by amplifying pain. So they're, they're amp those changes are amplifying nociception, which is then perceived by the brain as an increased amount of danger or damage, which leads to a greater output of pain. So some of the plasticity can be functional. So this reflects, uh, you know, altered activity due to changes in the excitability of neurons. So we can think about um, inhibitory postsynaptic potentials and excitatory postsynaptic potentials. And we can talk about, you know, maybe there's a little bit of change in the, the resting um, voltage level in neurons that leads to an increased excitability. So it takes less stimulus to actually activate those neurons. So some examples of that are homosynaptic facilitation in which temporal summation is a component of homosynaptic facilitation, which there's a progressive increase in pain intensity during re repetition of an identical noxious stimulus. So that, that kind of repeated exposure facilitates more and more homosynaptic facilitation, which leads to increased nociception up to the brain, which subsequently leads to an increased 
um, output of the experience of pain. Then there's heterosynaptic facilitation. When um, you get changes in synapses not restricted to the initiating nociceptor. So um, this is where you could get some of the crossover into uh, neural pathways that are supposed to carry light touch and vibration type information. And all of a sudden now, they're crossing over with the nociceptive system and light touch is perceived by the brain as nociception. And then you have disinhibition, which is loss of inhibition by decreasing GABAergic and glycinergic tone. And that creates to, that, that leads to increased hyper excitability as well. Then of course, there's chemical changes that can occur. So you can have an increase in inflammatory cytokines or different uh, neurotransmitters that actually increase the activation of NMDA receptors and the increased activation of NMDA receptors by things like certain in inflammatory cytokines leads to an increased facilitation of neuronal firing, which leads to greater nociception to the brain through the central aspect of the nociceptive system. Then of course, you can actually have the plastic changes in the way that the nervous system functions. So on, on the left, you'll see a normal amount of tissue damage leads to a normal amount of pain that would be expected. And then if you transition over to the bottom left, you see a normal amount of feather tickle or a normal amount of light touch leads to the perception of a normal amount of light touch by the brain. But if we go over to the right side where we see one of the structural changes that occur in central sensitization, a noxious stimuli is all of a sudden, boom, it's twice as much or three times as much or four times as much when it travels through the nociceptive system because it's amplified structurally because you lose the inhibitory interneurons maybe in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord and, and maybe further up the chain in the, uh, in the brainstem and that sort of thing. So we lose some of the inhibitory interneurons that are supposed to be gating out some of that ascending nociception and when none of that ascending nociception is gated out, the full amount of it reaches the brain, which causes the brain to perceive a lot of threat. And when the brain perceives a lot of threat, you lead to, that leads to a greater output of the experience of pain. And then, if you look at the bottom right, we have what I talked about a second ago, possibly with some of the heterosynaptic facilitation, where a light touch all of a sudden leads to a crossover through neuronal connections into the nociceptive pathway, which leads to pain. So now all of a sudden a light touch or you know, a, a really light pressure leads to the experience of pain because inhibitory interneurons again have been lost and they have they're no longer there to prevent some of the crosstalk that could occur between those um, A beta fibers and maybe some of the C free nerve endings or A delta fibers traveling up to the brain. So you get a little bit of crossover, and once that information hits the brain, it is perceived by the brain to be coming from the nociceptive system, which leads to the output of pain in a completely non noxious stimuli, which is referred to as allodynia. So, why does all this matter? Well, it matters because we need to understand that pain is not simply a reflection of tissue damage or inflammation, but also has a big central amplification role. So implying treatment targeted only at the peripheral periphery may not be effective in a lot of patient cohorts that, that present with persistent maladaptive central sensitization. So it's been pretty well documented that cases, uh, a lot of cases of knee osteoarthritis, of course, chronic low back pain, maybe long-term subacromial type of pain, subacromial pain syndrome, long-term tendinopathies, temporal mandibular dysfunction, fibromyalgia, migraine headaches, all of the chronic overlapping pain disorders probably have a pretty significant central component. So if we're only looking to treat the peripheral component, we're really going to be missing the boat and we're not going to be able to help these people very well, which our system is, of course, showing us with the rapid increase in the amount of chronic pain and the cost of treating chronic pain and our lackluster results in treating chronic pain. So here are a few of the resources that I used for creating this presentation. And ultimately, in a nutshell, what I wanted to do was differentiate between central sensitization and the different pain classifications, such as nociceptive, neuropathic, and nociplastic, 
and really drive home the point that central sensitization is a normal component of how the nervous system functions and we need to pay attention to that and differentiate it from quote unquote centralized pain or central sensitization syndrome or, or things like um, all the chronic overlapping pain disorders. Instead of just saying they are centrally sensitized, we need to understand the underlying neuronal mechanisms so we can go about uh, interacting with that person and treating them uh, more effectively. So hopefully this was helpful and I'd love some feedback down at the bottom in the comments.